This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everybody. It, it's uh, my pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Andre Davila today for this morning's Heart and Vascular Grand Rounds. Dr. Davila is the section chief of VP at the Harvard program at Beth Israel. Uh, he uh, hails from Brazil and I just learned that 20% of his time is serving his patients down there uh, as well and doing cases for them. Uh, after some time spent at Mount Sinai in Miami, he uh, made it back up to his fellowship uh, location in Boston. Dr. Davilas played a critical role in the pioneering of epicardial access, something that we do regularly now. Uh, and I've asked him to address this problem of ventricular tachycardia. Uh, as I've said before, and you all know, as the heart failure doctors get better and better at prolonging survival, uh, it seems that sometimes we struggle more and more with their arrhythmia burden. So uh, Dr. Davila will speak on the catheter ablation of scar-related VT. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure for me to be here. Really happy for the invitation. Over the last 30 years, there has been a huge change in the way we understand and approach ventricular tachycardia. In the early days when surgery was playing an important role in the management of these patients, for us to be able to ablate, we would use a completely different strategy from the one we're using these days. It would require VT induction all the time, which in many patients would make them sicker after the procedure because most of the VTs are poorly tolerated by patients. It would basically, uh, uh, try to define the areas of low voltage. And with these two pieces of information, during induction, we will try to define areas that were crucial for ablation to be done. Over the last few years, there's a completely change in the way some or most of us are approaching this problem right now. Most of the VT is now ablated during normal sinus rhythm requiring less VT induction independently from voltage. And we can now use image to guide our ablation procedure. And there are very uh, new and important ablation modalities. I'm gonna try to cover some of these changes and please feel free to ask any questions during, during the, the approach. When we compare what we first, when we first saw ventricular tachycardias in the early seventies to what we have now, even though it's the same problem, the way we understand the VT circuits and the three-dimensional distribution of the VT circuit, it's completely different from what we, from our understanding in the early 70s. Let me try to give you an example and we'll try to go together with this presentation. This is a patient had a previous MI and had a single vessel disease, had a proximal LED occlusion and presented in New York uh, Association class three with a low ejection fraction. The renal function was normal and the patient had several episodes of syncopal VT despite of high dose of amiodarone, which had been prescribed because of his PVCs prior to the beginning of his VT. So what do you see here? You see this immense, LV aneurysm. We don't see most of these patients these days because of early PTCA, but from time to time, I'll show you an example later of this kind of patient. What are the therapeutic options that we have here? We can think about an ICD, antiarrhythmic drugs, to change the antiarrhythmic drug or to add something, surgery, all of the above, but not surgery because surgery requires a specific uh, uh, training for you to be successful with surgery. Of course, many of us would say, I don't care, these patients are too sick or I, I, I don't know what to do with them. Let's go try to understand one by one what kind of options we have now. First of all, ICDs are an important therapy to prevent sudden death, but they are indeed the most painful treatment for VTs. And as you know, 
is high voltage shocks are not simply are not only painful, but they can also increase mortality. So it does prevent sudden death in those type of patients, but it can have an impact, an adverse impact on the overall mortality. Another option that we have is to use amiodarone. And based on a recent trial, as you can see here, if patients were not taking amiodarone, adding amiodarone as an option seems to be an okay alternative for this patient. But if the patient was already taking amiodarone, escalate therapy in terms of increasing the dose of amiodarone or adding a second uh, uh, antiarrhythmic drug, it's not a good option. Ablation can do a better job in those patients who are already taking amiodarone. The problem with amiodarone, as you all know, is the number of side effects that you have to deal with when you decide to prescribe long-term amiodarone for patients with increased protective card. The ideal approach then for our patient would be the one that would be able to control VT, improve his LV ejection fraction, and potentially treat residual coronary artery disease. In the, we had this experience in Brazil, which was exactly what we were doing. We were basically resecting the anterior aneurysm and going for double placation of the septal wall, which would result in a new reconstruction of the left ventricle. This was important, as I mentioned before, initially because the ejection fraction would improve dramatically in some patients. Second, the VT control, the, to control the VT recurrence was excellent. And these are prior to ICD. This paper published in 1998, and in 1998, ICDs were not currently uh, available in Brazil. So the results that you see here, just prevention of the VT recurrence, which with excellent results over a, a very long follow-up period. Despite of that, despite of treating CAD, improving ejection fraction and, and preventing VT recurrence, look at the mortality rate here. It's still very important. Then this is despite of what I just told you. So it's also important, it's important to keep in mind then that even when you succeed in treating VT, the underlying heart disease may have an important, a very important impact on, on the patient's survival. And up to this point, I'm not sure if we can prove that a bleeding VT changes the overall mortality. Of course, except in patients with VT storm and in patients with incessant VT. Another piece of information that was very important here is that back then, these patients were being treated in the OR without the need of intraoperative mapping. It tells you that depending on the strategy that you use to deal with different VT substrates, you can succeed even when you don't have a detailed map during the intricular tachycardia. It all depends on the mapping strategy that you're going to use and the substrate itself. This is a recent patient that we had here two months ago. As you can see, it's a similar situation. We have this massive antiseptic aneurysm here, and the patient came in VT storm was a little bit more stable during uh, with antiarrhythmic drugs, and he was referred to the EP lab uh, uh, for VT ablation. The patient had no stroke, no heart failure. That was to be difficult to justify surgery and for a surgical resection of this aneurysm. So. But the question that we have to answer is that how can I possibly change or modify this scar, which was able to sustain a ventricular storm with an ablation catheter, which can only produce very small lesions there. If I resect this whole thing with surgery, it's easy to understand how I'm preventing VT recurrence. But what do I need to do if my only ablation tool, if my only treatment option, it's catheter ablation, which will result in very small lesions here. This is very important for all of us to understand why catheter ablation is an important option. What I'm gonna to try to show you here is exactly the same thing. We had this patient with an inferior MI with VT coming from that area of scar. 
And again, despite of the size of this car that you can see here, even with some calcification, we were able to stop VT as soon as we started delivering radio frequency here, bridge. Let's show you how this is possible. Depending on the mapping strategy, and I promise this is the only, only EP tracing that I'm gonna share with you during, during this presentation. As you can see here, we have areas with very abnormal potential that can be located in normal sinus rhythm. Using some EP maneuvers, we can make these potentials look even more uh, delayed in terms of the beginning of the QRS. And these late potentials, maybe many of these late potentials are indeed the substrate for ventricular tachycardia. The areas where they come from are the areas that will have to be ablated. For us to make sure that these potentials are important for the VT circuit, we use different EP maneuvers. And as you can see here, this late potential now becomes what we call mid diastolic potentials, which are potentials that are happening in the middle of the electrical diastole here. These potentials are very interesting targets. As you will see, once we find them and we apply radio frequency energy, we are able to stop VT, even in patients with a large scar. And this is the reason why this is, this is a slide that was given to me by my mentor, Dr. Jacques de Bakker, when I spent some time in the Netherlands with him. And this is a very important piece of information. What you see here in white is dense scar. In black, what you see is the surviving bundles of surviving myocardium that are actually crossing the scar inside the scar in connecting one side of the scar to the other one. And as you can see here, this is a 3D substrate. This is one slice. And when they cut a little bit lower, this little black dot connects to this one. And that one will then connect the whole surviving bundles to the other side of the scar. And this is the substrate for re-entry to occur. So with this in mind, you can now understand why surgery if I have, if I'm able to resect the whole scar, can be successful in eliminating VT. As well, if I'm mapping and I'm able to locate these small bundles of surviving myocardium inside the scar and I ablate them, I'm gonna make this huge scar, even without removing it, uh, unable to sustain VT. As you know, most patients with post MI will not present with ventricular tachycardia, even though the scar, it's there. So for you to have VT, the scar has to have a specific arrangement. And this is characterized by the presence of the surviving bundles, which can be mapped and ablated with the small lesions with the ablation cap. And now we know, based on this beautiful work from, from Dr. Roderick Tang from the University of Chicago, that these bundles can be located on the epicardial surface. It can be located in, a, in the endocardial surface, which is the case for most patients in post-MI, or they can have an intramural or even a 3D distribution. And this is important for us to understand so we can define, we can design our ablation strategy properly. If the circuit is located on the picardial side of the heart, there is this approach, this technique, which we published back in, in 1996, that allows us for mapping and ablation along the picardial surface of the heart. After 25 years of the initial description of this technique, there is now a, a very consolidated amount of, 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 of a body of evidence suggesting that this can be done in a, in a safe way in most of our patients. This is a, an example. This is a patient with a nearly normal electrocardiogram, despite of the presence of signal averages positive here. This patient developed ventricular tachycardia and all the endocardial surface of the heart presented with normal electrograms. But when we went to the epicardium, as you remember these potentials from before, these late potentials became mediastolic potentials. And by ablating there, we are able to stop tachycardia. This is another interesting example. It's a patient who came to the hospital in incessant BT, and he was in the waiting list for heart transplant. So we went to the epicardial surface of the heart because these patients were non-ischemics. And as you can see here, in the non-ischemics, epicardial tend to predominate. 
There are also some ECG features suggestive of the picardial origin at, or at the cardio exit site. And as you can see here, the endocardial is kind of preserved, but you can see a layer of scar on the cl very close to the picardial surface. By going there and ablating there, we are able to stop this tachycardia. This is a very interesting case because the patient got a new heart 10 days after this procedure. So most of the time, when we think about the picardial circuits, we know now that it varies according to the underlying heart disease. In ARVC patients and in Chagas patients, it's mandatory to go to the epicardial space during our first ablation procedure. But in patients with uh, dilated heart, in patients with postamide, the vast majority of the circuits are going to be connected to the endocardial surface. So we can plan the procedure and we could plan to go epicardial, endocardial first. And then if it doesn't work, or depending on other characteristics of the VP circuit, we can go to the epi during the same procedure or reschedule the patient for a second procedure after the first endocardial procedure phase. One of the problems that we have when we try to ablate these patients is to, to negotiate between stable and unstable VPs. It would be fantastic if all VPs were stable, so we would be able to map and ablate during VT. But that's not the case. The vast majority of the patients that we take to the AP lab will have all or at least one unmappable VT. In order to overcome this limitation, we decided to give, to offer hemodynamic support for our patients. And this is something that we published a few years ago. So we were then using Impella, and with Impella in, we would then be able to induce VT. And as expected, with an Impella on, even though VTs were very fast, we were able to map for a much, much longer period of time, which would result in terminations of the VT in the vast majority of these patients. So that was a good option. The problem is that even with this impella in, as you can see here, this is a measurement of cerebral oximetry. Every single time we induce, there is a significant change on the cerebral oximetry, which has a cumulative effect. So the overall hemodynamic status of the patient at the beginning of the procedure, it's completely different from what you see after a few hours, especially after several inductions. So even though this was, a, this was an interesting approach, it wouldn't completely resolve the problem of hemodynamic instability during the procedure. And the reason for that is we, we, we already understand that is because the lower the ejection fraction, the longer it takes for the patient to recover after every single VT induction that we do. But that was not the only problem. We also understood that even though we are able to map for a much longer period of time and use several different EP maneuvers to locate the areas of interest, the overall results of our procedures were exactly the same when compared to the group of patients that had been ablated without hemodynamic support. So after this data, it would become, it was clear to us that the, the, the hemodynamic support would be useful in selected groups of patients who are very, very sick even before the first induction. But to use this as, a, as an approach for every single VT ablation, it's, it would be hard to justify it because at the end of the day, the overall results of this approach using hemodynamic support were not different from what we are getting in patients without the hemodynamic support. And as you know, at the end of the day, the overall results of catheter ablation in patients with VT is that we can offer a 70% freedom from recurrence in different series of patients there with an overall mortality rate of 15% at one year. So there is room for improvement there. What we are trying to do, keeping in mind these limitations that I just shared with you, is to kind of reframe the procedure. We would like to make VT ablation, which is very successful in some subgroup of patients, we would like to make the procedure shorter and safer. And for us to do that, we are 
basically mapping the substrate in normal sinus rhythm. I will show you some examples in, in a few slides. We are using image to plan the procedure and especially to plan our ablation strategy. And by doing so, we avoid VT induction and therefore avoid decompensation during and after the procedure in several of these patients. I'll also share with you some of our preliminary data showing that 80% of our patients can be discharged the same day after VT ablation procedure. This is a new image modality that we've been working with the University of Bordeaux, where you can actually locate areas within the scar that are the so-called anatomical channel. Those electrograms that I shared with you a few slides ago, and the late potentials, and that will become mediastolic potentials during VT, are likely to leave to reside inside some of these channels. Not all of the channels are channels that will be able to sustain VT, but those electrograms which you can see here are likely to be in, within one of these channels. So if I could use this image together with some mapping in normal sinus rhythm, I'm, my, I'm, I should be able to prevent some of VT recurrences. And that's exactly what we're trying to understand at this point. Because instead of mapping every single one of the VTs, which then will require several induction, as you can see here, depending on the substrate, on the scar substrate, it might be able to sustain different VT morphologies. Instead of mapping each one of them, I'd rather focus, try to ablate, identify and ablate the substrate. And by doing so in a consistent way, I should be able to eliminate all the potential VTs related to that substrate. So here at BI, that's basically what we are trying to do. We are trying to acquire pre-procedure CT and MRI. We never go retrograde or in the vast majority of the patients, we try conceptual and an epicardial approach, which are very well tolerated for these patients. We register the images. I'll show you an example in a minute. And we create like dense maps in normal sinus rhythm with using different multiple wave fronts. In other words, I can map the potential substrate in sinus during RV pacing or during LV pacing. And then we define the area that we want to ablate uh, without induction of the VT. This is an example. This is a patient came to us, like non-ischemic patient. And, and as I mentioned to you, this patient had a previous uh, endocardial failure. So we went to the epicardial surface of the heart. These patients have a, a higher chance of epicardial uh, circuits, especially after an endocardial failure. So we acquired this CT. The CT could actually show us this is the wall thickness map and there, this, this dark red means that the wall is around one millimeter and from one millimeter up to five millimeters. And as you can see here, there is a gradient of wall thickness. And this is the area where the channel is most likely to be present. So we can focus in that area. So what we did, we went, this is an epicardial map. The patient was almost an incessant VT during the procedure, well tolerated VT. So we took advantage of that and we decided to map in VT and we were able to create this map here. This is a very interesting map. I wanna just tell you very quickly about this. So as you can see, the wave front during VT creates this kind of figure of eight pattern. But what's interesting is that you can identify the portion of the, the wave front here, and then it disappears here, disappears, and appears once again down there. This is because the wave front took an intramural channel that cannot be identified by epicardial ablation. This is quite clear when you divide the diastolic area of VT, this is the, di the electrical diastole, and we color code them. So we can clearly see that we are missing some colors because the colors are now represented by activation within the wall, not along the surface that we are mapping. And again, by using some uh, uh, AP maneuvers, we were able to match the, the VT morphology there. And as we decided to ablate in this region, 
an ablation within very few seconds it was able to stop this ventricular tachycardia. This is another example that we were mapping uh, at this time. I'm sorry, let me just go back one. Uh, we were mapping this patient here in normal in, during RV phase. What's interesting is that I'll show you in more details in, in a second, but as you can see here, this is different from taking a catheter and trying to homogenize the entire area of slow conduction. As you can see here, there is a scar, which is represented here by this color between blue and red. The purple means normal voltage and, and most likely normal uh, ventricular my, uh, myocardium. And as you can see here, the area that we're able to ablate is just includes a little portion of the entire scar. And as you can see in this particular example here, during mapping, we were able to identify an area that is very late and that is protected by a line, a clear line of block. So the wave front comes from this side and it stops here. Every single color represents the wave front, the distance that the wave front can, can travel during a, a specific amount of time. If the collars are very narrow here, it's because there is a lot of slow conduction, if not block. And as you can see here, between here and here, the wave front will stop and go around and come back inside this little channel here. This is another example that we did during RV basis, and it gives you exactly the same piece of information. As you see here on this part of the panel, I have those late potentials there that I can map and create this activation mapping normal sinus rhythm. As you can see, this is very early and a few centimeters from here, it's very late because there is block here and making the wave front propagate all the way to the top of the heart and come back and enter this nice channel. This is a perfect substrate for a VT to occur. You can imagine that even though this is happening in sinus, this is the VT would can propagate in this region and go back and create these reentrant circuits there. When we, and this is the example that I was showing you before, again, doing RV pacing, I have this late potentials here that when I map them, I'm able to identify late potentials, the ones you saw before that can be crucial for the VT map and ablation strategy. We are able to identify the lines of block protecting this isthmus here. This is all in sinus. This is the kind of substrate that in the past we were only able to see during after inducing VT. And we have this region here, which we call areas of very slow conduction because the isochromes will basically group around this specific portion. And this is the area that we very, very likely to be the substrate for VT. And once ablated patients, will not have a VT again. So that's the potential channel, which was ablated. It's the same concept here. This is the example that I was showing you before. This is our pre-ablation map. As you can see, the wave front stops here, goes around and comes into the channel. And once we ablate, this whole activation is, by, is now homogenized and we don't see the channel. The, chan the conduction within the channel was completely eliminated. And, and hopefully this patient will not have, no longer have a substrate for VT to have. This is all done in sinus, so the patient can, we don't see any decompensation. That same concept, when we add the images, I was just showing you the CT images that I was just showing you before, we can also have interesting information. As you can see here, we had the same map during RV pacing, and we had this potential channel of, uh, conduction here, likely to be the substrate for the VT that this patient was having. So in this area, it's full of this late potential, but once we superimpose the images that were obtained prior to the procedure, uh, to the map that was just created in sinus, as you can see here, there is a clear overlap. So in other words, we, were, we, were, we would be able to actually ablate this channel even without mapping in normal sinus, because in most of the patients that we have done so far, we can actually see that the anatomical channel corresponds to the area of our electrical channel there. There are now trials in Europe, two of them, using exclusively the images to guide 
their ablation strategy. And this is something interesting because it will not require induction of VT and clinical deterioration of the patient during the procedure. This is just the same example that I was showing you when I place my ablation catheter there, guided by my electroanatomical mapping, I see that my ablation catheter is sitting exactly where the anatomical channel created, obtained by CT was. So then with this, you can understand the principles that we're using. And by doing so, we are able to eliminate all these late potential topic ablation. As you can see here, this is now, this is pre-ablation of the channel. And I have my mapping catheter sitting in exactly the same region. And it has been completely modified. And, and this patient, are, all the patients that I'm showing you here now, they're free of VT, even though VT was never induced during their procedures. When I wrote my first paper on VT in 1994, I was basically trying to understand why we fail during VT ablation. And I think that based on the information that we have now, we can deal with this, even when we are dealing with large scar, when we have multiple VTs, when we have epicardial circuits, I think all of this is already been solved somehow. What we need to do is to understand if the mapping in VT, which is important for us to establish, to understand parts of the circuit that are functionally determined during VT, if we can also identify areas of the substrate that are fixed, they're anatomically established, and by modifying those areas, if we are going to be able to eliminate VT in general. I think this is what we're trying to establish now, which is if we have, we can get some clinical benefit of out of a VT strategy, aim it of modifying potential fixed barriers in the VT circuit. So if we can do so, the ablation will become a, a routine procedure with reproducible results. And by doing this in sinus and without challenging the clinical situation of the patient, I believe that the patient can come to the lab much earlier and which would make VT ablation not a last resort option, but rather we can go there, modify the scar and prevent VT recurrence in, in a way that patients can could not be put at risk during the procedure. So very briefly, just to finish this presentation, we have a small number of patients. I, I came to BI last October and we've done 35 cases, VT cases so far, but this is most of our patients are at an endocardial approach. And uh, I'm sorry, this is an extremely short follow-up. It doesn't mean anything. It only means that with this approach, we're not being arrhythmogenic, we're not causing complications. And that the recurrence rate with this approach with a very small number of patients and an extremely short follow-up, uh, the number of recurrence that we've had are exactly the same kind of recurrence that we were expecting in, in patients that were mapping during VT. So this is what we're trying to do now. And we are basically collaborating with other centers, trying to establish the role of mapping and ablation in sinus of these potential channels to see if we can change the way ablation of VT is being offered to our patients. And I know I was just talking to you guys uh, uh, minutes ago, in some of these patients that we can define the substrate in sinus in a very detailed way, even if we have VT recurrence, which of course will happen. Once we have that piece of information, those maps, we can now not simply go back and try to re-ablate these patients, but there are different ablation options that we can use once we have a very detailed map of the potential VT circuits. And with that, I would like to stop here and, and more than happy to ask any questions if you have some. Thanks a lot, that was great. Uh, are there any, any questions? I was interested that you said you almost never go retroaortic. Uh, why, why is that? I mean, we do that frequently here. What, what your approach is almost always transeptal. That's how I was trained, first of all. And you know, there's this 
these patients are old. And I'm sure you've seen this, this trial in Europe that came out like a few weeks ago, just confirming that when you go retrograde, there is a higher risk of, of cerebral events from stroke to bubbles. And I try to avoid, and it's not that I don't go because depending on the location of the circuit the, where you have to ablate, if your catheter is not very stable there using a transeptal approach, then I go retrograde. But my first approach, it's always transeptal. I think it's safer to map because you loop the catheter instead of the direct approach. And, and uh, that's what I've been doing. I think it, it, there is, it's not a problem to go retrograde, but in, in patients, let's say you have a patient who's 80 years old in, in VT. If you can avoid retrograde, I think it's safer, it's better for the patient. Th that's been my, uh, I've been mapping transeptal for a long time, and I feel more comfortable transeptal than retrograde for that reason. There's a question in chat, Dr. Davila, that says, has your group incorporated any VT strategies in patients undergoing LVAD, uh, scar exclusion? You mean during the procedure, during uh, the LVAD implant? Correct. I don't think so. This is something that we should do. It's an incredible opportunity to, to, to understand and modify the circuit during VT. And as I mentioned to you, now we can define the substrate even with, uh, with some CTs. So just for you to understand the CT, what we do in collaboration with Bordeaux, we get the CT here, we send the CT to Bordeaux, they apply their software and they send it back to us. It takes like 24 hours or so. But as you can see in some patients, it becomes really clear where the circuits are supposed to be. And with that information in mind, it would be an incredible opportunity to cry or to modify the substrate during the alphabet implantation. We haven't done it that yet here, but we, we're planning on doing so. One big hurdle is getting our surgeons to spend that time. I mean, that's a huge logistic burden for them. To One of the reasons for catheter ablation to be, to grow is because of what you just said. It's difficult to get good collaboration from surgeons, but once again, we, if you could image this, because surgeons are very visual. <laughs> so if you can show them where the circuit is, uh, it, you know, it's easy enough to go with the cryo probe and, and ablate around that area. I think we should, that's what we've been trying to do, as I just said. And, and I think we should not waste the opportunity to do so if we, if we have the chest is open and, and we are manipulating the heart. You're talk was entitled scar-based VT. What's your sense of how many patients deal with a non-scar-based, non-reentrant VT, an automatic and this sort of thing? Well, uh, I, it happens, for sure it happens. Even when I say the scar-related VT, I think what I mean is when you can clearly define the channels that are there. Even those patients with automatic VTs, you know, even if it's it's a hypertension automaticity or some automaticity related to, to the areas around the scar, uh, those are impossible to map without VT, as as you know. So, luckily, these patients do. I guess they represent the, the minority of all the patients that we that we have to ablate these days. But when it when it happens, the only option that you have is to try to 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 induce VT a little bit. The problem is that these automatic, automatic VTs, are, which are related or not related to SCAR, they're typically very fast. So you need an ablation strategy that, you know, you can, if you're able to capture the initial bits of that VT and then you have to cardiovert and use again, cardiovert and use again, it's, sometimes it's, it's a very complicated procedure. There was a chat question. When do you opt for these other adjuncts, non-ablation? Uh, sympathectomy, renal artery, uh, it, it, that, that sort of adjunctive therapies, when do, when do you pull the trigger for those? I think sympathectomy, uh, what we typically do, it's of course, uh, uh, when we never offer sympathectomy if for our, our, as, as our initial approach. But in patients with incessant VT, patients in VT storm that respond well to local uh, ganglia blockage, then after the VT ablation, we, even though we patient 
patient does not need to have a recurrence, I'm happy to talk to them about sympathectomy. The problem with sympathectomy, as you know, is that again, we need to talk to the surgeons because if they don't go up to T1, to the middle of T1, it, it's, it doesn't result in any clinical benefit for those patients. So you need to, to talk to them and explain what exactly you need to do uh, before you go there. If they don't have this clear understanding, it's a waste of time for the patient. But I think that even though this has not never been published, I only offer sympathectomy for those patients who respond to ganglia blockage. And, and if you've done that, the response in some patients, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. So the patient is having like VTs, nearly incessant VT, you inject and this thing stops for 24 hours. I think these are the patients who will benefit most from this kind of approach. I, I know the data on renal denervation, but I haven't done that in my patients so far. I, I, I'm not sure what exactly the renal denervation will do for, for, for ventricular tachycardia the same way. It's, it's, I, I'm not sure the data is already there for AFib and VT ablation to add those procedures to, to, to this kind of patient. Hey, Any other questions? Mike. Mike. Hey, Mike. Can yes. Yes, Dr. Clements. Yes. So uh, I have been uh, interested in an amateurish way in trying to figure out where these reentry uh, automatic spots are. But I, I have noticed that uh, with our nurses, and with our interns and with our residents, uh, they, can hand, they can hand you a strip that has VT on it. And you can say, where did this come from? Or what lead is this? They don't seem to uh, pay much attention to that. And I watch you guys, as you looked at 12 lead, when on occasion we catch VT on 12 leads, and I watch you plot the vector out and say, well, this is coming from the posterior lateral wall basal segment. Uh, you all pay a lot of attention to that, right? You, you do and like to see that, I assume. Number one, number two, it seems to me that our nurses and our interns and residents don't take advantage of that uh, bit of information that you can glean from those kind of strips and 12 lead tracings if you have the opportunity. So it, th would you agree with that or? I, I agree with that. 12 leads? I, yeah. I, I agree with that, but I mean, there are several limitations when you are trying to plan your ablation strategy based on the electrocardiogram which is good to identify in the exit point of that VT. But sometimes the substrate that you need to ablate is not related to the exit itself. So let's say point. you mentioned that the case that you know, the patient has an exit in the infralateral wall, but sometimes the so-called channel, it's far from that. It's not uncommon for you to pace far from the exit site and get a ECG morphology that is identical to the ECG that you had before. Not to mention that most of our patients have a 3D uh, uh, kind of circuit. So the, the, the ECG is an important tool, but it gives you, in terms of ablation, it gives you the zip code of the VT. It doesn't tell you where the VT necessarily leaves. So you know that it's in that street, it's around that area, and you should be able to get like five square centimeters in, in terms of where the VT is truly located when you analyze the ECG. The ECG is also important sometimes to differentiate endocardial from epicardial circuits, especially in patients with non-ischemic VT. In those patients with non post MIVTs, you can, there are some interesting features in the, in the EKG analysis that can completely change your initial approach. If the patient has a clear suggestion of an exit, an epicardial exit, because again, the ECG only shows you where the exit is, even though 
the core of the circuit can be a few centimeters away from the exit, you're gonna plan for a picardial procedure depending sometime on, on what you see on your EKG. So to answer your question, I think you need to get all the information that you can possibly get from each piece of, of, of data that you have in, in for that specific patient and try to explore the ECG as much as we can. Great, thanks so much. Thank you. Dr. Mehta asked um, about PVC ablations. So how, how does your approach differ when you have someone with PVCs? When, when do you ablate PVCs? I'm assuming in patients with non-ischemic or, or in patients without scar, right? So I think, to be honest with you, you know, when you have, what I typically do for these patients, I get a stress test and I check for the PVC burden. And of course, if they're symptomatic. If they're symptomatic, the indication is it's quite clear. In asymptomatic patients, I think we need to ablate when the PVC burden, or the, the number of PVC, or the complexity of those PVCs, they get much, much worse during exercise because you can put these patients at risk. And when they are asymptomatic and you have a PVC burden, even if it's a high PVC burden, I typically try and tend to follow this patient for a few months. And if the ejection fraction is completely normal and the PVC burden is less than 20%, I'm going to follow these patients. When the PVC burden is higher than 25, 30, 40%, most of these patients sooner or later will develop some sort of, of, of ventricular remodeling. It can be seen by a change on the, the end diastolic and systolic volume of the ejection fraction itself. But you know, we can follow most of these patients who are asymptomatic, make sure that we, we understand what exactly is happening to the ventricle and test them from time to time with the, with the echoes and, 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 and stress test. We don't necessarily need to ablate patients who are completely symptomatic with 10, 12% of, of PVC burden if the ejection fraction is normal, and especially if the exercise will suppress those PVC. That's my overall approach for this case. I think that mimics uh, our approach as well. Very good. Any other uh, questions for Dr. Davila? Okay, I, I think we'll conclude. And I wanna thank you again, Andre, for giving a fantastic talk on a tough subject. And um, we look forward to having you come to Atlanta when, when, <laughs> whenever that time will come. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to, to meet you guys and thank you for the opportunity to present some of the data that we are using this day. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.